Girl, you've got questions. Questions about your body and how to feel good in it, about your hormones and how to keep them in check. Questions about your sex life and your whole health. Can you imagine having a best girlfriend who was also a triple board certified OBGYN? A girlfriend doctor you could call and ask or tell her anything. Someone who could show you how to live any stage of life before, during, or after menopause in a big, bold, and beautiful way. Well, friends, I'm your girlfriend doctor. I believe you are meant to flourish and shine, to embrace life and awaken to all its possibilities. Let's get there together. Welcome to our show. Welcome to the Girlfriend Doctor Show. I'm Dr. Anna. I am thrilled to be here with you today. We are going to talk and dig into how to reframe and rewire our brain. Right now in this season, the month of March, the theme for me and the theme for my Girlfriend Doctor Club is about resilience. And that is really about being strong in the face of challenges and to face the storm full on and to really learn how to see the silver lining. And the truth is there's so much we can do to rewire our brain and to have joy and peace and patience and passion in the midst of all of this stressors that we face on a daily basis. So can't ignore them, but knowing how to deal with them and choosing what we focus on is essential to creating great health. Well, today I am bringing someone who has actually been a mentor to me. She has published 19 books. She's a leader in the space as a neuroscientist. She is Dr. Caroline Leaf. She's really an amazing woman and she is so accomplished. She spent the last 30 years researching the mind-brain connection, the nature of mental health and the formation of memory. She was one of the first in her field to study how the brain can change with directed mind input or neuroplasticity. Plasticity. And throughout her years of clinical practice, she's helped hundreds of thousands of people learn how to use their mind to detox and grow their brain to succeed in every area of their lives, including school, university, and the workplace. And what I really love about Dr. Caroline Leaf is that she's also incorporated into her business her daughters who work with her too. So I love that. Her latest book is Cleaning Up Your Mental Mess. And I've been dog earing it and tagging it and underlining so many areas. And we're going to discuss her five steps, her five steps to really rewire our brain. She calls it five simple scientifically proven steps to reduce anxiety, stress, and toxic thinking. So oftentimes we go down the same path over and over and over again. Well, that's because we're wired that way. So we have to conscientiously change our wiring, change our thought process, and we can do it in the moment. I know many of you have known my story. With the loss, the tragic loss of my son, Garrett, I had incredible depression, grief, trauma, anxiety, PTSD. I was in the midst of it where I couldn't see it. So steps that I've taken over the years, steps to rewire my brain to live life and experience joy and happiness again to recreate the strongest bonds in my family when we were so fragmented have been a crucial part of why I'm here with you today and why I'm so passionate about sharing sharing Dr. Caroline Leaf and her work and her her message with all of you today. So grab a pen, grab a paper, and I'll be right back with my guest, Dr. Caroline Leaf. Well, welcome Caroline to the Girlfriend Doctor Show. Thank you. It's so lovely to see you again and to talk to you again. And you live in my and you live in my hometown now. I didn't even know that down the road, which is lovely. I know, I know, and I look forward to getting together for dinner and really connecting. I know both in Dallas now. So that wasn't wonderful. intentional, but here we are. <laughs> it's so interesting. Yeah, wonderful. Did you get power outages last week? Did you have the whole with the whole snow and very briefly, but definitely the freezing temperatures had a toll on the building with some water pipes busting, you know, the 
crisis for everyone listening in Dallas. We had a big freeze right in the middle of February at the time of recording this. And yeah. it was challenging. How about you? How did you? Yeah, we, we lost, well, we lost power. We in South Lake. So we lost power for three days and mm. elect and water for two days. So it was awful and Wi-Fi and everything. We had to go to a hotel to actually work and then sleeping back at home because we had all the pets and things with a thousand blankets on us and <laughs> but it was you know it was bad it was oh thank, thank goodness things are, are good now again yeah, yeah yeah it seems like the you know infrastructures there's a lot to be a lot to be done a lot to be done Let's absolutely talk about, you know and and with a crisis like that right we you know face this term, this crisis and and Southeast Georgia, I was used to hurricanes, never yeah. snow, but hurricanes. This creates a mental toll, unexpected, environmental. And I saw I saw reactions all over because there's that next door app. I don't know if you got that next door app, but you can your no. neighbors will, you know, I said I can help with A, B, and C. And yeah. neighbors will some will be very positive and encouraging, and others were like losing it. Mm, uh, losing seeing the it. Diff- yeah, totally so, upset. So the meant the you know when we're approached with this type of um, acute acute trauma acute trauma acute situations yeah we've got to manage them. Now that's well, the thing is are, are what we need to understand and that's what I write about in my book cleaning up your mental mess and what I've studied for now nearly thirty eight years is what is the mind and how what is a mental mess and what does it all mean thoughts and things and so when life happens like these acute traumas that we have to face like the recent storm that you just mentioned and whatever I mean COVID and the politics and those are sort of the big things but then there's the little things that happen in our own lives that are not so little some of them are major crises and then there's the little day to day things of just managing you know, time and, and um, imposter syndrome and arguments and all those little things, all the, all of that's mind. Mind is the source. Mind is the primary force. And if we don't understand mind, then we kind of get battered around. And that's what this book is about, helping people to understand what mind is. It's been my sole aim of my research over the past 38 years. And even as a clinician, I practiced for 25 years, working with people with dementias and traumatic brain injuries and learning disabilities and acute war trauma. And in the apartheid South Africa, where I grew up and in the transition and the post-apartheid and from the rich to the poor to every socioeconomic, I worked tirelessly to try and understand what mind was because it's one of those areas, Anna, that is just not researched. It's kind of, well, it is, but it's just kind of lumped under a stress response or, you know, one of the things you do along with green juices and a bit of meditation. And it's, it's so much more because it's the mind, you go to bed with your mind, you wake up with your mind, you choose your clothes with your mind, you eat breakfast with your mind, you listen to this podcast with your mind, you answer the next email, your mind never stops. So if we don't understand mind, how do we clean up the mental mess? And if mind is always working we really should make it a priority because it's behind the scenes it's it's the thing that drives everything else and if you think of just coming into this pandemic prior to that we already had such a major problem with mind because people have been there's the deaths of despair for years people have been living longer because of um of the advances in medicine and technology but between 96 and 2014 this trend reversed so just prior to the pandemic we already were in a state where mind had been sort of mismanaged to the point where people were dying from 8 to 25 years younger from preventable lifestyle diseases. And now with the pandemic, that's added another year onto that. And all of that lumped together is telling us a story that as humans, for the last 40 years, we've been kind of obliterating the mind stuff, focusing so much on the biology, on the discoveries of neuroscience have have almost consumed us to the point where the brain and the body are everything. And you as a human with your story, well, that's just besides the point because let's look at the symptomology and let's take the biomedical model, which you as doctor, you know, works beautifully for the body, but it doesn't work for the mind because the mind and the body are separate. So based on that, um, we have to understand mind in order to be able to know how to manage things like crises, et cetera, which is what this book's about. So it's a big mouthful. (laughs) Oh my gosh. And I love it because I highlighted in your book, you know, here we are cleaning up your mental mess. Okay. This is out now in March at the time of this release. And I highlighted this one second. It said, it is, it's time for society to start honoring people's stories and what we're going through, not make us feel like there's something wrong with us. If we feel sad or depressed or anxious, or that we're abnormal and have failed in some way, if we're not happy all the time. That's that sums up what I was trying to say. That's what, that's why I developed this work and put this into this format so that people can do it. 
define the mind because like we can sit here and saying, I use my mind to do A, B, and C. I'm like, really? Like, what is the mind? Yeah, it's a great question. So <laughs> the, the way to, you would have seen Nothing the Nothing easy, right? Nothing easy. Uh, it's got to be well, like, oh, it should just be this part of your anatomy, but no. Well, that's, and that's how it's been presented as being this part of your anatomy, that your mind and your brain are interchangeable. And for those of you that are just viewing, I mean, or listening, I'm holding up a brain in a skull and I've got a little body of a, a sort of a, a human body. Not I love a it because I'm usually model. holding up a pelvis, you know, and everything else. So I love you've got your brain. I've got my pelvis. <laughs> there you go. Well, I've got kind of a combination there. So anyway, basically we're not our brain and our mind is not our brain. Mind and brain are not the same, but for the past 40 years, that has been the message. So most people think they're the same thing. And that's been to our detriment because it's it's made everything about the biology. So every symptom, every emotion, emotions have become have become a symptoms of a disease instead of a warning signal of an underlying something that's going on in your life. I mean, there's a massive distinction there. So every anything we experience emotionally and behaviorally have become symptoms of a disease or an illness. So we've medicalized misery. We've medicalized the human experience and reduced it down to biology versus seeing it as a unique person's story. And you can, like the classic example, and is that now in this COVID situation, just every day there's a paper, more science coming out and there's articles all over the place. Oh, we're in, we in for a pandemic in mental health. We already had a problem prior to this. In fact, we've had a problem with mental health since the beginning of humanity. In other words, if you're human, you have mental health challenges because life is unpredictable. You can't control events and circumstances, but you can control responses. So mental health is not something new, this mental health thing. It's how we've managed it that is, is not good. We've managed it in this very biological way and we've taken out the story element of a person's life and, and taken away the whole context and the community aspect and also we have are not dealing with the socio-political economic kind of factors as well and racism and all those things which are contributing largely to anxiety so for example with this whole pandemic we've got this whole acknowledgement of the isolation and the you know the what the experiences that we've had and the grief and the uncertainty and the medical and you know, the threat of medical um, uncertainty and so on that's all been happening and we all acknowledge that that's made us anxious and, and de depressed of course it is that it's totally normal response to adverse circumstances. And every period of history has gone through various different, you know, major things happening. World War One, World War Two, the Spanish flu, and then every generation and then every family and then every person is going through this. So we can't just go and say, okay, well, we acknowledge that we, which we all agree that this, that's going to have an impact and make people feel, but it doesn't mean that you're sick. It doesn't mean that you have a mental illness. So that there's a paradoxical kind of thing going on where they saying, yes, there is an increase in, and yes, people are more depressed. If you lose all your money and you lose a loved one, obviously you're going to be depressed. That's a very normal human response to have that grief. But to say that, okay, so we need to up the, the, um, the treatment plan, which is diagnose, label, and give medication, and maybe a little bit of you know, conditioning, that doesn't treat the problem. That's creating more of a problem. And we see that from the research, that that approach for the last 40 years, which is what they're offering now as the solution, is, has really made things bad. So it's going to make a bad situation even worse. So we have to come up with an alternative. We have to come together and recognize that it's, it's not the person's fault. It's the situation. And in fact, it's never, you know, we've got to acknowledge that we've got to own our stuff. So things happen to us. That's not our fault, but we are responsible for what we're going to do with that. And we need help to be able to manage that. Then the things that we do do wrong, which we all do, because we all make, we're all experimenting. Life is one big experiment with our mind that we then need to own that. So if you've said something to someone and it's not nice, own the guilt and fix it. As opposed to, oh, I feel guilty and shame and condemnation and then you don't do anything and then that becomes worse and then you're all anxious and you think you're sick because that's the message that's being given to you. So we have to shift all of that. We have to come together, take responsibility, talk about this. If you're human, whatever you are, you are alive, you're a mental mess. How do we manage that? So in order to say all of that, we come right back to your question, kind of long lead in to what is mind and what is brain. So your brain is this, it's this physical part of you. It's, it's, but it's not your mind. If you're dead, this is dead, this, this goes. But with you being alive now, listening and watching, the energy force of your mind is what's keeping your brain and body alive. So your mind is this external force that also moves through the brain and the body. And psychologically, mind is how you think, how you feel, and how you choose. 
You never do those three things separately. You're always thinking. You're always, when you think you will feel, when you think and feel, you will choose. You're always thinking, feeling, and choosing. That is mind. Mind equals think, feel, choose. You're always thinking, feeling, and choosing. You wake up doing it. You go to sleep doing it. You're always thinking, feeling, and choosing. And there's a consequence of thinking, feeling, and choosing, and that is a thought. And thoughts look like trees, and I'm holding up a little green plant, and like trees have got roots and branches, a thought has got roots and branches. So the thought now in the, at the moment that's been built is about this whole mind brain COVID pandemic mental health etc and that's all the roots this is what I'm talking about this is the seeds that are being sown I mean and the, the, the root memories that are growing this the tree trunk and the branches are your interpretation of what I'm saying so each person's interpretation this part's going to be different for everyone but the source is is what I'm saying and what we're discussing and that's how all experiences form whether it's this discussion whether it's the next conversation you have whether it's the next email whether it's the next plan you're making is all based on these thoughts that we are constructing and we construct them based upon our existing thoughts and all of the construction process is mind mind is the constructor mind is the think feel choose of the experience doing up the past, putting it all together, building these thoughts into our brain and our body. So mind is this external force that is 99% of who we are. And it's not something weird. A quantum physicist won the Nobel Prize a couple of years back for their work on gravitational fields. Einstein did work on photons and the photoelectric effects and gravitational fields. This is quantum physics. It's one of the most accurate forms of science, of accurate um, accurate branches of science um, and fundamental branches of science. So we use all those quantum physics and electromagnetics and gravitational fields to understand that every human has their own unique gravitational field around them. And that's the physical side of the think, feel, choose. So think, feel, choose is over and all around and it's gravitational fields. You've got yours, I've got mine. I can't take yours, you can't take mine, but we can enhance each other or we can, we can hurt each other because we're impacting each other because of the relational nature nature of gravitational fields and of mind. So mind, think, feel, choose, gravitational fields, brain, physical, and you are not your brain. The two are inseparable. The mind needs the brain and body to be able to express you. And therefore, that's, there's this inseparable relationship. So that's a long answer, but I think it kind of unpacks a lot of concepts. Oh my gosh. And it's so good. And you do go into it so well in your book, Cleaning Up Your Mental Mess, which I found that it's it's been very, very helpful to me. And also the practical approach, which we're We'll go ahead and dig into now the practical. You talk about five simple scientifically proven steps, but we're like, what we need to do to switch our, sh shift our mind, shift our experiences, our 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 actions based on the stories that that we we've, we've experienced or that we have or that we've you know made up or we've heard about ourselves that have been written on us by other people. Like how we now shift the way that we we interact and and react in the world and i think what a couple of things you've got great diagrams in here i'm like oh yeah fits the science geek in me just beautifully as well as the research section but the practical work in that you did this in, in clinical trials to look at number one you know the number of antidepressants etc hasn't changed mental health the generational impact on our children of our mental health is, I mean, it's a generational impact. Yeah, yeah. And, and everything that we can do to shift our, our thoughts, our energy, right? And, yeah. Um, our behavior and is going to, because I like how you say, you know, think, feel, and choose. This creates our thoughts and thoughts, you know, create our actions and how this will shift our behaviors and, and how, we, how we can live and enjoy life, right? Yeah, absolutely. So it's so important that we recognize that it's human to feel anxiety and depression, that these are not bad things, that these, if you see them as bad and unhelpful, you actually will have an, your, there's a stress response in your body, which works, which actually is designed to help you be more focused and get your brain and body prepared for whatever it needs to do um, in, in a sort of ideal functional state. If you see these as helpful, then your stress response will work for you and do that. It'll prepare you for wisdom and for the best next action. But if you see these as, oh, they're terrible, they're illnesses, I'm feeling anxious, there's something wrong with me, I've got a neuropsychiatric brain disease and all these scary terms that are out there and there's something wrong and I'm crazy and all the 
implications, that puts, makes the stress response work against you. So now you've got 1,400 neurophysiological responses working against you instead of for you. And you know that's going to throw your hormones out. That's going to throw your cortisol levels, your glucose, your DNA, I mean, everything. And yet we can change that. We can manage that process. So there is a response because the mind works through the body. So obviously the brain and body are affected. But because of the flexibility or the neuroplasticity of the brain and the, and the actual variability or the ability of the body to change the plasticity of the body as well. I mean, we're making a million new cells every second. Because of that, when we shift our mind, which is the driving force of any change in our brain and our body, um, we are going to impact how we function. And I say driving force because people think, okay, well, I can also do exercise. I can also do eat healthy. We've got to do those because that's how you look after the physiology and the, the physical, but your mind's still in it. So you can be doing the most fantastic fasted workouts, eating the most clean diet of farm to table, wild, organic, you name it. But if you haven't got your mind managed, it's your mind that's behind the exercise. You have to use your mind to exercise. You have to move your mind, use your mind to decide what to eat and to eat. But if you're not in a state of mind management, you can lose up to 80% of the nutritional benefit of the food you're eating because you're, for example, you're pancreas won't work properly, which means then your gallbladder, then your the whole cycle of digestion gets interrupted by your uh, my, my mind mess, mental mess. But if you clean that up, then you get the benefit. So people think, okay, well, I'll, I'll go and do exercise to heal my depression. You must do the exercise. Your depression will definitely reduce because it changes the chemical structure and so on. But if you still don't sort out the issue, the toxic issue, you're going to lose up to 80% of the benefit and very fast. So the exercise long term won't help. You're still going to feel stuck. So we have to live lifestyles of mind management. We have to accept that depression, anxiety, fear, terror, grief, they're not going away. They're not going anywhere. And they're, they're actually your friend. And others sounds crazy, but they're actually your friend because they are messengers of an underlying issue. So instead of seeing depression, anxiety, toxic thinking as an illness or something bad or evil, see them as helpful messengers telling you something. So you want to embrace them and process them and reconceptualize them because you otherwise you grow, they, they grow into your brain, but they grow in as, as toxic, um, toxic structures, which are basically proteins that are folded incorrectly and chemicals that are flowing incorrectly and incorrect, incorrect vibrations inside the basic proteins. I mean, I can go into all the science, but these are as real as if you had a COVID virus. Yeah. So that the, the immune system of the body recognizes COVID as a virus and sends out immune factors, T lymphocytes, B lymphocytes, macrophages, etc. The, the immune system of the brain does the same thing with the toxic issue. So if you don't deal with that toxic issue that's causing the signal of worry or the signal of despair or the signal of all of those anxiety, depression, you then have an immune response in your brain going on creating inflammation in this area. And it's inflammation is supposed to be a temporary protection. Like the immune goes to fight it and then you know you're supposed to deal with it and it goes away but if you don't deal with your stuff if you don't manage the mental mess then that doesn't go away but the minute you say okay i recognize depression and anxiety is helpful i'm going to find out why the minute you do that the immune system response changes and so does all the neurophysiology change so you still haven't totally fixed it yet because it's going to take time at least nine weeks to uh, cycles of nine, 63 days to fix but the mere fact that you're in that state of mind that you're fixing is bringing healing and resilience into your brain and your body and that's what the neurocycle is that I've developed over 38 years I mean it's a lot of clinical application and they're not just five I don't do the quick steps this this a techno technological age that we live in has created a quick fix mentality, hurry sickness, get it done fast, take the tablet, you know, take, do the five, give me the five steps and I'll be better. And no, you will not be better in five seconds. You can use the five steps because they basically, they're not a technique. It's a system of how to get your thinking, feeling and choosing under control so that you can direct the neuroplasticity of your brain and, and, uh, and, and the health of your body. And then you can use it quickly in the moment to bring your mind back under control because we should be self-regulating all day long. But we've also got to identify the patterns in our life that are coming from the toxic patterns that are probably coming from an underlying trauma or toxic habits that we built. And those need to be addressed because if those aren't going away, those are causing brain damage and inflammation and messing up the hormones and all the implications, whether there's a genetic weakness or whatever. So the neurocycle is the basic system. It's not a technique. It's not a therapeutic. It doesn't replace therapy. It enhances therapy. You go to therapy once or twice a week if you are going or counseling or coaching. What are you doing with yourself the rest of the week, the rest of the day, 24-7? Mm -hmm. So the neuro cycle is pretty much how you manage your mind to be able to manage every moment and, and the big stuff. So in the moment and the big stuff. 
and I'll, I'll just sort of end off with that particular part with this, that we can go three weeks without food. We can go three days without water. We can go three minutes without oxygen. We don't even go three seconds without thinking, feeling, and choosing. So my argument is if you are doing it, and if you don't control it, it's a mess, producing this mess. So you may as well learn to, reg to self-regulate and mind manage, and that's what the neurocycle does. And I think this whole concept of creating a lifestyle of mind management is is going to be you know part of our healing as a as an individual Body. healing as a family healing as a culture a community and a world and i'm i'm, I'm excited so. to bring this bring this information into our audience so we are going to uh, be right back in our next segment and and really talk about these key ways that we can re rewire rework our our thoughts our feelings and our choices, right? We are working yeah. every week in the way we think, feel, and choose to create a healthy behavior. And then again, right? It's it's about like I can't heal the body without healing the mind. Exactly. And it is, and it, it's crucial. It goes both ways. Uh, the you a healthy a healthy body leads to a healthy mind. A sick body leads to a sick mind. A sick mind leads to a sick body. And there's no way around that for sure. And so it's a combination of the two. Dr. Leaf, thank you. I will be right back. Welcome back. In the first segment, we really talked about some of the neuroscience behind why our mind is different than our brain and how it can, you know, how we can rewire and control our actions. And this all concept of lifestyle management, lifestyle mind management, I mean, really, this is critical because currently what happens, you get a diagnosis, you get a prescription, and then you you know, maybe get some therapy, but yeah. digging out the roots of the problem. And you really show in, in your book, which cleaning up your mental mess, you really show like how these thoughts can be toxic and the physiologic effect of them. And we really have to uproot them from their roots and create new patterns. Absolutely. And, and, you know, this is something that we can, it's a skill that we could learn, Anna. And that's what's so beautiful is that mind management isn't something that you can't improve. We all think, you know, we all understand you can learn to eat a healthy diet and you can learn to get into an exercise program. And you can, I mean, you teach that so well with the work that you do, but that's also mind driven. You have to have, I can know about your stuff, but if I don't have my mind in a place where I just, if I just use my mind to just hear, I'm not going to change. But if I use my mind to hear and apply, so it's knowledge, application, attitude change, and application or skill development, that's when the shift will happen in behavior. So the neurocycle is also to be able to take those lifestyle changes if you need to make to diet, exercise, et cetera, and actually learn that stuff. Get your book, learn that stuff, and apply that in your life. Mm -hmm. So it's the, that's the brain building aspect. Mm -hmm. But in terms of, of like the moment by moment stuff, we people get stuck. We feel like I get all the time. People say, oh my, I'm, I've got low self-esteem. My, my head doesn't stop. I'm exhausted. I'm burnt out. I don't know how to deal with myself. I'm sitting there. These, these are the kinds of things people say to me in email and DM, they're stuck in their mind. And all of us have experienced this. If we're honest, yeah. we've all had our moments where, and we will have them and that's okay. That's really the very strong part of my message is it really is okay. And we can, we can learn to, um, if we recognize that those are helpful messengers, we can change them. So the neurocycle has grown out of trying to find a simple way that I could work with patients in severe trauma, severe traumatic brain damage, emotional trauma, severe learning disabilities, dementia, I couldn't give them a whole fancy science thing. So I initially started out clinically trying to understand what the mind was, what the brain was, all the stuff we've been talking about, and then find out, how, find out, do we have autonomy? Do we have a sense of agency? Can we change this? Can we control these thought things that are growing? And if I've made a mess, can I fix it? And the answer is yes, we can. We are designed to develop our minds. We should be teaching this to our kids from very young. I did. My kids are all big now. And I've taught my, some of my patients were three, two, three in schools I've worked at across the globe from very young, at the very young age, the sooner you start this, the more, the longer the impact and the greater the impact. I'm not saying that if you manage your mind through the neurocycle that you're never going to have another bad day. 
in fact, I'm going to say that you will have a lot of bad days. You will still have a lot of messes. Probably every day you'll have some. There's a difference, however. You'll know what to do about it. So like for in my own life, now I developed this and I've been learning how to use it. I'm getting more and more efficient at using this. So I may get upset about something that happens in my family maybe. And normally in the past that would have affected my whole day, maybe my whole week and affected my sleep. Now I can neurocycle, I can acknowledge that, become aware of it, manage it, compartmentalize it, and go into an action where I can actually solve it to whatever extent it can be solved. So I'm not thrown by it for days on end. And now I see patterns in my life. I can recognize the patterns and then do the work to find out why, I, why have I got that pattern? There's a reason. There's no reason why, if you're feeling constantly depressed, there's a reason. If you've got this constant irritation or the way that you're responding that's upsetting other people, there's a reason. Own it. Don't feel bad about it. Own the, take the guilt, the condemnation, that energy of that, the energy is never lost. It's only transferred. So transfer that toxic energy into, okay, I own it. Let me fix it. And that's essentially what I'm trying to help people understand. So the steps have been developed meticulously and simplified and researched and refined. And this book presents the latest um, updated most simple version um, of them. And, and I show that when you do the five steps of the neurocycle, you can improve anxiety and depression by up to 81%, which is phenomenal. And managing That's toxic yeah. That is. I mean, if you think of it in, a, in, in what that means in terms of time, let's say that your day is 12 hours long and you're spending 10 hours of that day in a state of ruminating and responding to people pleasing and imposter syndrome and getting like so upset about something that's happened that it's penetrating your day and arguments and then a bit of happiness and then if you're feeling and then burnt out at the end of the day by neurocycling which is mind management you can actually change reduce that by 80 percent so that drops down to maybe two hours of your day and then eventually less and less and less and it's still going to happen you're still going to have those moments but you'll know what to do. So essentially, I don't know if you want me to. Jump yeah. Into so that. let's talk about oh, what we do. Yeah. What we do when we are in that moment and these steps, how we implement these steps in the, in the heat of the situation. Okay. So in the second part of the book is where I explain the five steps and how they work and how to apply them with toxic traumas and um, acute traumas and in the moment stuff, which I call neurocycle life hacks. So the in the moment stuff that happens like you've got to deal with an argument and get in front of the camera or whatever. Um, and um, then I also explain how to brain build and all that stuff. So the five steps basically are gather awareness, reflect, write, recheck, and active reach. Each word, each step is a whole concept that is doing amazing things in your brain. So for example, gather awareness. When you gather, think of an apple tree that's full of apples and you're going to pick apples and you go up to the tree and it's so full that you just bump it and all these apples are falling on your head. That's not gather, that's being hit by life. And I think a lot of times we feel like that. So what, when I say gather awareness is like, let's say something happens in your life that totally throws you and you feel like, oh my gosh, everything's just hitting me. This is just too much. Stand back away from the apple tree. So many Mentally stand back and create that space. And I call that the multiple perspective advantage. So this is not step one. This is how you prepare. So this is the mindset that you go into using the neurocycle. So you first recognize, okay, I'm going to stand back. I, this is happening. So it's the self, it's the awareness. So you can't, you, you can't, it's, it's, it's all together. You're gathering awareness, but you've got to prepare. And the awareness is I'll stand back and I will gather. The control is coming to my hands. I'm not going to get the apples on just and randomly have apples controlling me. I'm going to stand back and pick the apples. That's really important. And we can, when we do that, we actually call, allow the two sides of the brain to balance and you get the balanced blood for an oxygen and you start getting things like the alpha wave, which is an energetic response in the brain. When we start getting a calmer and we start getting more insight and we start being able to dig into the why, you want increased alpha and you want it balanced across the two sides of the brain. You want little bursts of what we would call high beta in a balanced way across the brain to able you to get those there's those insights. You want beta online. You want gamma, which is creativity and so on and so on. So there's a whole, and I explain that in the book and there's um, pictures and all that kind of stuff. But essentially what I'm saying is that as you do each step, you're going to start put, creating this brain health resilience that will then help your body and brain together work with your mind so that you can have wisdom. So gathering awareness in this way where you stand back and observe your own thinking, feeling and choosing um, enables you to create that space that creates a kind of reaction inside of the brain. So you don't go in 
under the apple tree and all hit you on the head, you actually create the space and it's called the multiple perspective advantage. So you got, you kind of, you, you are the, the messy, there's the messy Caroline and there's the wise Caroline. You kind of split into two and you start talking to yourself as though you're giving yourself therapy or whatever, however you want to look at that and, and use you instead of I, I can answer, but it's, so, and it's non-judgmental and it's totally safe and it's okay because everyone messes up and someone who has been in that position where you have, you're not the only one because so often we feel I'm the only one experiencing this and we know that's not logical, but we still, mm -hmm. you know, feel it. So we've got to train ourselves to recognize, listen, there's been someone, many other people in that space before. So it's, that's the attitude you go. If you want the neurocycle to really work, you've got to go in with that kind of attitude that I've just described. And then you gather, gather awareness, gather. It's, it's this, this control thing. Instead of the apples falling on me, I have a basket. I choose the apple. So what apples do I choose? There's four main apples that you gather awareness of. The first one are the emotional warning signals. The second is the, is the physical warning signals. So the emotional would be things like um, de uh, de depression, anxiety, and so on. The second, um, physical, so things like heart palpitations and adrenaline shooting through your gut. You know, what is your physical response? The third one is your behaviors. What are you saying? What are you doing? The fourth one is your perspective. How do you see? What's your mindset? Life sucks. Or I'm never going to get through this. Or no self-esteem. So you gather awareness in a totally, I cannot stress enough, accepting and non-judgmental way. All those signals are not threats to you. They are helpful by by doing it in this way, you've shifted all your neurophysiology and now you can control it. So this is the pathway to empowerment. This enables you to get to recognize your agency because you can think, you can feel, and you can choose. That's agency. Agency means that I can look at this toxic thought and the toxic stress and I can start seeing the barriers as opportunities and I can start getting empowered. So that's the attitude coming into gather awareness. Then what you've gathered in your basket, you now very objectively and clinically reflect. Reflect is a beautiful word. It's, I mean, you look in the mirror and you reflect back. That's your whole human. I mean, it's incredible what you actually, if you really look at who you are and what you are, that reflection is amazing. So reflect is a very broad, deep ask, answer, discuss. Why am I feeling these signals? What do they mean? And then what that information you gather that you get from the gather and the reflect you write down. And in the book, I teach you a system called the Metacog, which is a powerful, powerful way of writing that I use with my patients for years, extreme situations of people with suffering from battling with split, you know, split personalities from tremendous trauma to people with severe learning disabilities. The Metacog is one of the most powerful ways of writing where you can get the depths of what's in your brain and in your mind out on paper and start finding out why and getting to the core of issues. So that's the third step is to write and then the fourth step is to then check what you've written because as you write it's kind of messy you want it to be you want to vomit everything on on the page so the recheck is to look for the patterns and the activators and the antidotes and that kind of stuff and then the fifth step is a little action that closes off the cycle what have you learned from those four steps what's your takeaway that can anchor you in a space of learning for the next 24 hours because the idea is not to drag this out all day long. So let's say, let's take the scenario of you, you see there's a pattern in your life and you keep on snapping at, I'm thinking of whatever, snapping at your work colleagues or you keep on getting low, very, very low self-esteem each time you go into a conversation and you feel let's like- you're use, Let's use the imposter syndrome one. Okay, yeah, because that's very- I love yeah. that one. Very yeah, common. And, and, and I have, I, and I, I have it. <laughs> we, we all do. I have a neurocycle for imposter syndrome in the book, and there's an app called the Neurocycle app. That's also that's also got a whole neurocycle that walks you through the exact questions to ask for imposter syndrome. So okay, so let's say there's that that's a regular pattern. You see it's happening a lot. It's stimulated by whatever. So now you need to dedicate 63 days. And in the first 21, you're going to work through all five steps for 15 to 45 minutes. So if it's 15 minutes, it's about three minutes per step. If it's 45 minutes, it's obviously a little bit longer. But you don't go longer than that because this is hard work and it gets worse before it gets better. So you limit your time that you spend on the hard stuff so that you can still run the rest of your day. So you don't try and fix this in one day and you can't. That's not possible with the whole mind-brain integration, the way it works. It's going to take time. Mm -hmm. And then by the 20, each day, something more will be revealed. Each day, you know, you start the first day and you don't really see much of, of the origin story, the roots. But by the 15th day, you've digging away at this and you're starting to find more and more. By the 21st day, you've deconstructed and reconstructed the toxic thought into a new reconceptualized concept that this is what happened and this is why it happened. So I would have patients, my subjects at the beginning of my study, and there's a beautiful image. We've got some brain images in the book and this is this really is so cool and I want to show you very quickly. I managed to convince my publishers to put 
printed. That was hard work. I but know. I, believe me, I, when you get colored copies in there, I was so impressed. I know. I was it's so excited beautiful. to get them. Like looking it, at all the graphs and the images. Oh. Great stuff. So it makes it so much easier to see. So, so, so very quickly, this is someone, let, let's say that if you're battling with imposter syndrome, um, this particular subject was suffering with this plus extreme depression for everything. Their life story was horrific and they were just like, they were giving up, whatever. So at day 21, looking in their brain, we saw flatline using the, which meant that the, none of the waveforms, blood energy, everything was going on. They were so inflamed. They hormones were a mess. They were a mess from every angle and desperate. By day 21, after using the neurocycle, these five steps daily for 15 to 45 minutes, the brain had, that's gray. The gray means it's stabilized. The green means that the identity had shifted from here. It was, I am depression. I am hopeless. I am, there's just like, I can't do this. To, I feel depressed because of so no longer am I depression. This person by this point in, this, in the neurocycling had reached the point where they could say, I know why I feel depression. I feel de I'm not depression. There's a reason. There's a, it's a symptom. It's not a sickness. Um, I can see why. I'm starting to see how. And excitement and sustainability and starting to sleep, 25% more sleep and that kind of stuff. By day 63, they had, were saying, I now know why I get depressed. I've started seeing the roots. I know what to do. I know how to manage it. And it's changing in the, in the actual behaviors were changing. They were, no, they were able to get back to work, get back online with their relationships, no longer feeling suicidal, all kinds of stuff. And this we saw consistently. This is not just one. This, was a, this is a pattern I've seen for years. Mm -hmm. the, the next page is someone who didn't manage, they were in the control group. This is someone in the experimental group. So they got the actual um, system. They got the neurocycle. That red brain over there by day 63 shows a person who's been made extremely aware because we did all this testing, the neuroscience testing and the, um, the, the, the blood and DNA and narrative and psychological. So biomarkers we too. All I'm the biomarkers. Testing. Yeah, we looked at a lot of biomarkers. But they, so they had awareness but no treatment. And so they, they got red brain means that they're completely and utterly like their brain was, they were wrecked. Their bodies, their biological age had, had got older than the actual chronological age, et cetera, et cetera. And that, I mean, pretty serious stuff. We obviously gave them the neurocycle at the end of the nine weeks, but just shows you that with, and so many people are living in that state. They're living in a red brain state where, or a blue brain state, and you don't have to. You, so instead of living in that state, you're going to have days of blue brains and red brains, blue brain extreme, you know, sort of the depression, the depression side of sort of flat side and their despair and whatever. And the red brain being the more anxious on edge, can't cope panic attacks. We, we're going to have that, but instead of it being a lifestyle, it'll be momentary. It'll be less and it's manageable, you know, so I'm not saying it's going to go away, but it's going to get less and less as you manage it more and more. And you stop seeing yourself as depression or as anxiety and, and that you're ill and you start seeing yourself as having a response to life and that here's a way of managing it. It's a massive shift. So that's kind of what it does. Oh, it's incredibly empowering. I could talk with you all day about all of this <laughs> stuff. I'm telling you, I love this. I, you know, from Thank you. early on, I think like the, I remember being in um, school and in, in college and I was a biology and psychology make, major and the psychology professors like you're burning yourself out because I was working in the clinical lab I was working to put myself through college and he said choose one I said how can you separate the two what what you're teaching here is is the power I mean really to be empowered then the bible we always talk about renewal of the mind, mind yeah of the mind not of the brain not of the yeah. body I mean, all of that's awesome. important restoring the temple of our spirit the cathedral of our spirit but renewal of the mind. And so um, you talk about the NeuroCycle app and I want you to let people know where to get that app and we'll put links. And plus, I want to just a shout out for everyone, you know, this book, Cleaning Up Your Mental Mess, it's groundbreaking. And again, giving you practical steps that empower you to improve your health. And while you're adding this to your cart, Dr. Caroline Leaf has one of my favorite devotionals, 365 Days to Switch on Your Brain add that into your shopping cart because you will love it. I have gifted it to oh. over a dozen people and thank it you. Is my favorite. Yeah. For sure. Thank you. That's so sweet of you. Thank you. Well, they can, they can pick up the book wherever books are sold and um, the, my Instagram handle is Dr. Caroline Lee. So from there, as you know, you can pick up everything and Dr. Leaf.com is my website and my podcast, which you've been on, we did a fantastic interview last year and that's called cleaning up your mental mess. So people can find out more there as well. 
I love it. And then the NeuroCycle app, you referenced that. Yes, yes. That? That's your iTunes and Google Play. So it used to be called the Switch app. So some people may have, um, already, there's a lot of people already using it, but we've updated it and um, put a whole lot of new content and so it matches the book. And then there's a lot of extra, like um, besides the basic program, there's also all these NeuroCycle guides, these life hacks like to how to deal with imposter syndrome. So I'll walk you through the five steps, how to deal with grief, how to help your children NeuroCycle, how to deal with anger, how to deal with, you know, panic attacks. So neurocycling in a very practical sense. So Excellent. that's thank the, you. well, thank, thank you, you for being with us and uh, for our audience. Thank you for being here on the girlfriend doctor show. I want to again, encourage you to follow Dr. Leaf and her social media, Instagram. She does coffee with Caroline and it's just a beautiful uh, session that she puts in there as she's been launching her okay. book. And, um, and just to take this time to introspect and say, okay, what are, some of the thoughts that aren't serving you right now and commit to taking these five action steps, taking your next right step to heal from this so that you can have the peace that surpasses all understanding and live, live your best life in your best relationships. Y'all thank you for being here on the girlfriend doctor show. And I look forward to seeing you next time. Mm -hmm.